Good morning. If you're able, would you remain standing for the reading of God's Word? Uh, we're starting a new series. Uh, Pastor Brandon is going to be preaching on Judges. We're going to be reading chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, the chair in front of you, right underneath the seat, you can find one. Uh, that can be found on page 237. Uh, if you don't own a Bible, please take that one with you as our gift to you today. Judges chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Now the angel of the Lord went from Gilgal to Bochum, and he said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you unto the land that I swore to give to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. What is this that you have done? So now I say, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become thorns in your sides, and their God shall be a snare to you. As soon as the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the people of Israel, the people lifted up their voices and wept. And they called the name of that place Bochum, and they sacrificed there to the Lord. And all of God's people say, Amen. you may be seated. Uh, my name is DeWitt Moffitt. I'm on the elder team. And again, we'd like to welcome you to Mill Creek Community Church. If you're here for the first time, we want to take just a moment and let you know how much we appreciate you being here today. Uh, in the back, we have a welcome center. There's some people back there that can uh, answer any questions you may happen to have uh, for us. Uh, they'll share our mission and our purpose. Uh, there's also a gift for you back there. Uh, for the welcome cards, uh, you can actually fill these out online or you can fill them out here. Uh, you want to put down as much information as you feel comfortable putting down. It's also a great resource if you have any questions, uh, concerns, if you have any prayer requests or praise reports, they can be placed on here. Uh, you can actually put these in the white boxes by the door. Uh, you'll see those. And uh, let's see, for the worship guide... We have some upcoming events, so you want to make sure that you read through there. Uh, a couple of these that I'd like to just touch on with you. Uh, we have a membership class. It's going to be January 21st and 28th. Uh, this is a two-part class, so you'll want to attend both of those. Yeah, you can put that on your connection card if you're interested. And today will be the last day to sign up for that. Uh, also, the Keep... Keystone Family Alliance fundraiser is here at MCC February 23rd. That's from 6.30 to 7, I'm sorry, 6 to 7.30. And you can come and hear about the state of uh, vulnerable children in Erie. And actually across Pennsylvania, there's uh, uh, great information about foster parenting and adoption. So you want to definitely take a look at that. And... Um, and would you pray with me, please? Precious Heavenly Father, we come into your presence today with gratitude for all that you have done for us as a body. Uh, Lord, we remember what has taken place over the last year, how faithful you've been in this body of believers, how you've encouraged and loved. Uh, Father, we prepare for this message. We ask that you open our hearts and minds, and, and bless Pastor Brandon as he brings your word forth. We ask all this in Jesus' name, and all of God's people say, amen. Amen. Thank you, DeWitt. Uh, just one more quick uh, announcement for you. Um, if you are following our Bible reading plans on those little blue bookmarks, um, the way we produce those is we put four on a piece of paper, and then we cut those apart and just helps us save on paper and all those great things. But what we found was this. The fourth one had the wrong scriptures on there. So one in four of those is actually wrong. So um, 
when our team discovered this, they were horrified. And I said, listen, this is what we believe about God's word, that as we read God's word, it's powerful to affect change, even if it's not what everybody's reading at the same time. So if you have one that has chronicles on it, um, you're a lucky person. You have the, you have, you're one in four. So um, I don't think that means you go play the Powerball today, but... Um, you definitely are lucky to get that one. You can swap it out. There's more in the back. We've, we've fixed the issue. But um, uh, if you really like Chronicles, just keep reading in Chronicles because at the end of the day, you're reading God's Word, and that is the most important thing. So we are going to be starting a, a series here through the book of Judges. Um, so if you have your Bibles already open, uh, we're going to be in Judges 1 and 2 today. But, but as, you're, as you're kind of flipping there, I just want to ask a question and just kind of pull the audience real quick here, Okay. How many of you, by show of hands, have ever, at any point in your Christian life, heard a sermon on the book of Judges? Just raise your hand, okay? Wow, that's a lot less than I thought. Just keep your your hands up, okay, if you can, all right? All right? So if the only message that you heard on the book of Judges was on either Samson or Gideon, put your hand down. Okay, good, good. A very select few, okay? Let me ask you this then. How many of you have ever heard an entire sermon series on the book of Judges? If you've never heard one, put your hands down. We have one person, two people, three people. There's a couple. Okay. That, is, that is very different from what I was expecting, but kind of what I was expecting. Because when we look at Judges, Judges is a very interesting book. It's, it is a book that is... Um, it is like taken straight from the young and the restless, right? There's murder, there's romance, there's all kinds of things that happen in this book that we're going to read and we're going to be like, it's going to feel like we're reading a soap opera at times. But what we know about this book is that it's an extremely interesting book because what it does is it recounts for us some really interesting times in Israel's history. It's a, it, it recounts times in Israel's history that are not good times, in fact, they're bad times. Like I said, there's, there's murder, and there's rape, and there's murder, and there's human trafficking, and there's murder, and there's kidnapping. And did I mention that there's lots of murder that takes place? So you might be, you might be thinking, well, well, Pastor Brandon, I, I don't understand. Like, we're going into a new year. You've given us a new theme to the next generation. Why are we going to study a book that is so discouraging? And, and you might even be asking yourself, why is Judges even included in the Bible? Wouldn't it just be easier to say, hey, let's leave this book out because you know what? It is not making Israel look very good. In fact, that's how most secular historians wrote history. Is if they lost a battle, they'd just leave it out of history altogether. Or if it made them look bad, they'd leave it out of history altogether because they said, we'd rather much chart the good things than the bad things. So why does God ordain a book like Judges? Why does he, why does he include it in the canon of Scripture for us to study? What, what is it showing us today? Well, I think in order to answer that first question, we need to look at the context of our book what we know about the book of Judges is this, is that the author of the, the book of Judges is not expressly stated. In fact, it's, it's very widely unknown. There's a lot of people that attribute this book to Samuel. So Samuel was writing this book. He was kind of like the last judge of Israel before they go into their monarchy. So they believe that he wrote it during the kingship of Saul, and he was writing it to the Israelite people as a letter to remind them of these times. But the vibe of this book is, is not a very good vibe. It's, it's a very discouraging vibe. It's not, not one that we're going to run to to seek to encourage us for very dark and difficult days. Uh, in fact, this book recounts dark and difficult days. And it's a book that centers on failure. Uh, that, that is a, a theme that we're going to see from start to finish, from Judges 1 to 21. Failure permeates this book. So why? Why would we have this book in our scriptures? Why would God include it in the canon of scripture? It's easier just to forget it. But what we know is that Judges is written as a warning to the people of Israel. And I think that, that in a larger context, this book is written as a warning to us as well. You see, I think that it's something that if we're not careful, we can very easily slip back into in our mindset. But Samuel was writing as they were going into the new kingship that they would not slip back into these mindsets and beliefs and unbelief that they had because it was destroying them as a nation. Winston Churchill is 
quoted as saying, those unwilling to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And I think that we would do well to read this book of history and learn from it as Christians as how we're following God and how we should be following God even today in our lives, but how God is also encouraging Israel to follow him in very dark and difficult days. And, and to be honest, I love the book of Judges. There, there are some cool stories of God's provision and providence. There's cool stories of God's salvation that comes to the people but in, intermixed in all of that is very difficult things. Because this book doesn't just recount the good things, it, record, it records everything about Israel's history in that time. Warts and all. See, it's a, it's a difficult book to process, but it reminds us. It reminds me as I study the book of Judges just how jacked up I really am. It reminds me how sinful I truly am and how much I really need Jesus on a daily basis. Because were it not for Jesus, were it not for his grace, the book of Judges could very well be interpreted as the book of Brandon, the book of you. We see that these things can very easily creep into our lives, so let it be a warning to us that this can be a a difficult book to process, but it's a very important book. If I were to illustrate Judges for you, I, I would say it's like this. I was thinking about this the other day. I'd say, what is the most out-of-control circumstance that I've ever experienced? And, and, and it would be like this. It would be like me opening a box of, of, of Sharpie markers, giving them to my daughters, leaving the room, and expecting them to be responsible. Right? If anybody has kids, you, you just cringed as I told you that, Right? Because what you can picture is that, that that situation would just unfold very poorly, that your white sofa would probably end up looking like it belongs in Elton John's house because the markers would be everywhere. It would be a disaster. The, 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 the things would go off the rails very, very quick because what happens is we take matters into our own hands, and that's the illustration of the book of Judges. They start well, but they finish poorly. Despite all of the craziness, despite all of the the warts and everything that we see in this book, what what we do see is that we can gain a deeper insight into the character and the nature of who God is because this book is revealing God. It's revealing his character. It's revealing his love for us. So as we read Judges, let me just caution you this way. Do not go looking at the Judges as spiritual role models because you will find none. They might have some good qualities about them, but but most of the judges are pretty messed up people with deep daddy issues. And you say, well, he's just saying it to be funny. No, that's true. We're going to see their dads. We're going to see their parents. We're going to see the failed discipleship that they had to their children, and those daddy issues play out in the fact that they're messed up people as well. See, God raises up these men and and he raises up these women because there's women judges as well to be agents of deliverance from the enemy and to bring the people back into a relationship with God and to save them from the people that are oppressing them. But what we know about these judges is that they function like saviors, but they're flawed and they're broken saviors. And and, and we'd be careful not to make them saviors or or be like a Gideon or be like a Deborah or be like a Samson. We're not going to hear those kind of messages in the series because they're broken. They're flawed. In fact, these judges make us long for a more perfect savior, a more perfect judge that will come. See, these men and these women cannot be our ultimate Savior because they're flawed and they're sinful just like us. The equivalent of this would be like putting somebody who does not know how to swim as lifeguard of a pool. How many people are they going to save? None. Why? Because the person that's drowning, that's struggling to swim, is not going to be saved by somebody who's equally flawed as they are. The book of Judges is exactly that. It's it's flawed people ministering to flawed people, but God is using them. God's Spirit is empowering them. And God is being honored and glorified even in very dark and difficult days. See, although these judges are designed to deliver, they're designed to be saviors, it never lasts. 
The salvation that they bring ultimately fades and they go back into a different cycle. And this book, as we read through it, it makes us long for a complete salvation. Not a salvation that's part of a cycle, but a salvation that will be to the uttermost, to every aspect of who we are, redeeming us. And the good news of this book is this, that this book offers us that complete salvation. It offers us in God sending Jesus to die in our place and for our sins, to bear the burden of our sin that he did not deserve. He took it for us so that we could have complete and full salvation. So as we look at this time period from the judges to the monarchy, what we're going to see is that it covers about 300 years of Israel's history. Almost as long as America's been a nation, we're going to cover in Israel's history over these next 16 weeks. These 21 chapters are going to chronicle for us over 10 generations who are going to rise up and pass away. Rise up and pass away. And the theme of Judges, the theme that that permeates Judges that we're going to flush out in this this series is this, is that, that this is a case study in failed discipleship to the next generation. In fact, that's your first point that you have on on your your, your, uh, note sheets there. Judges is a case study on failed discipleship to the next generation. And we see that theme very clearly by examining the start and the finish of this book. Let me just just chronicle both for you. Judges chapter 1 verse 1 says this, After the death of Joshua, the people of Israel inquired of the Lord. Just stop right there. This is how the book opens. We know two things right off the bat. Joshua is dead. The the spiritual and military leader of Israel is gone. He's dead and he's gone. And that could have easily created an identity crisis for the Jews. But what do they do? They seek the Lord and they inquire of him. Showing us that, that they respected and they honored the Lord as their leader. That at this point they're still operating as a theocracy. God is over all. He's their ruler. He's their leader. He's their guide. We read this, this is a great way to start the book of Judges. But unfortunately, if you've read the book of Judges, or as we read and study the book of Judges, we're going to look back and see that this is a precipice on which Israel stands, upon which they're going to take a step out and fall off a cliff into blatant sin and idolatry. Because at the end of Judges, the very last line of Judges, the first line, they inquired of the Lord. In Judges 21, verse 25, I'll read it for you. It says this, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Look at the stark contrast. They inquire of the Lord. To to 300 years later and 10 generations later, they did what was right in their own eyes because there was nobody leading and guiding the nation. There was somebody leading and guiding the nation, but they were unwilling to follow him, and it was God. So we see the next chapter of Israel's history is that they go looking for a king, like all the other nations, and that sets them up for failure as well. They move from seeking the Lord to seeking themselves, to seeking their own desires, and and they set themselves up ultimately as God because they're doing what is right in their eyes. They're following their own desires, their own own wants and their own needs. They're saying, this is what I want, this is what I need, this is what I desire. I'm going to do it. It's right for me. It sounds a lot like our culture today. Your truth is your truth. Live your truth, and nobody else can tell you that it's not your truth doing what is right in their own eyes. We're ushering in children into this generation that's telling them, do what is right in your own eyes. And as we read Judges, that was the place where they ended up, and we're going to see just how messed up it was for them to get there. We need to be discipling to the next generation. See, in 16 weeks, we're going to end up exploring this ending a little bit more, but let me just give you a quick window into the events, right? Right? At the very end of this book, they end up chopping up a concubine, shipping out her body to the 12 tribes of Israel. They encourage human trafficking. They murder one another, and they encourage kidnapping. And it's all summarized by this one verse. They did what was right in their own eyes. They failed to cultivate a love for God 
and pass that on to the next generation. They failed to obey God. They failed to disciple the next generation. And the byproduct was this. It's why I've made our rallying cry this year to the next generation. That's not just a one-time message. You're going to hear that all throughout this year. In fact, you're probably going to be very, very annoyed by the time you hear it all these times this year. But what we're going to see is that is our goal, is to reach into the next generation, to disciple the next generation, to teach, to love. And to pass on to the next generation. And chapter 1 of Judges introduces the problem that sets the stage for the entire book. So the question that we're going to answer today is this. How do we fail in our discipleship to the next generation? How, how can we fail as Mill Creek Community Church looking at the discipleship of the next generation? We're going to look at how Israel failed. And it's no different for us that we can fail in the same way cultivating a love for God in the next generation. I have four answers to that question today. How do we fail in our discipleship to the next generation? Let's read Judges 1, verses 1 through 4. <clears throat> it says this. After the death of Joshua, the people of Israel inquired of the Lord, Who shall go up from us against the Canaanites to fight against them? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have given the land into his hand. And Judah said to Simeon, his brother, Come up with me into the territory allotted to me, that we may fight against the Canaanites. And I likewise will go with you into the territory allotted you. So Simeon went with him. And verse 4, which I don't think we have on the screen because I added it, uh, is in your Bibles there. It says this, Then Judah went up, and the Lord gave the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand. And they defeated 10,000 of them at Bezek. Just stop right there. Let me give you a a quick side note that's important as we study this book. One of the problems that people have with judges is, as they say this, how could God allow the Israelites to go and kill innocent people, to go and conquer innocent people? How could God do that? And the simple answer is that the people that they were conquering were not innocent people. What we know about the Canaanites is that they were, they were a very wicked people. The Canaanites was a broad term for all the people living in the promised land of that time. The Perizzites, the Philistines, the Ammonites, the Ewoks, the Klingons, all those different people, they were living in the land, right? And as they were living in the land, they're, de- they're broadly defined as the Canaanites, but we know that they're extremely wicked, they're extremely sinful people, and God was going to judge these people for their sinfulness. God was going to judge these people for their lack of desire to follow him. He's going to judge them for their sin, and he's going to eliminate them and their idolatry from the land that he's giving to Israel. In fact, this idea of, of, of God judging these people is perfectly illustrated for us in the defeat of the first king of Bezek. His name was Adoni Bezek, which means king of Bezek. Look at verse 7. It says this, And Adoni Bezek, after he's conquered, Israel ca- captures him. What they do is they take him and they cut off all of his thumbs and they cut off all of his big toes. Really weird way to do things, but it makes sense when we read verse 7. And Adoni Bezek said this, Seventy kings with their thumbs and their big toes cut off used to pick up scraps under my table. As I have done, so God has repaid me. And they brought him to Jerusalem and he died there. Totally cut off this guy's thumb wrestling career, right? But what they do is they they treat him basically the way that he was treated. And he sees that and he says it's justified. Now it's very bad theology, But he's a very secular man, and we know that. But what we see is that he saw God as justly dealing with him and his people for their wickedness, for their sinfulness. You see, we have an issue with what God's doing, but even the people that were conquered did not have an issue with what God was doing. They saw their wickedness. See, the conquest of the land was not a crusade, But it was God's judgment on the people who lived there and he was using his people Israel to do that because God hates sin and his justice demands that he punish it. But it's not just for the Canaanites. What we're going to see in Judges is that God hates Israel's sin. God hates your sin. He hates my sin and he must punish it. And he's going to treat Israel the same in this book. 
So the first answer to our question is, how do we fail in our discipleship to the next generation? The first answer is this. We fail when we develop a small view of God. We, we fail when we develop a small view of God. Israel, in verses 1 and 2, is given a divine direction by God to go and to take the land. And he says, hey, Judah, you go first. And Judah says, great, I'll go first. God's literal words to them is, Judah, you go alone. You go first. You're the, you're, you go by yourself. He doesn't say take anybody else with him. And immediately, Judah works contrary to the word of God. What does he do? He invites his little brother Simeon. He says, hey, Simeon, let's go together. Let's help each other out. What we see is that that was not God's word. See, the easiest way to build a small view of God is to neglect God in his word. If we read scripture, if we study it, if we memorize it, if we meditate upon it, what will happen is we ask ourselves, what is this teaching me about God? It will increase your view of God. So when God speaks to his people, instead of taking him literally at his word, they bring matters into their own hands and they do things their way instead of God's way. God's word was not band together with Simeon and go. It was, Judah, you go, and you go alone. God was going to show them just how big of a God he was, and he didn't need Simeon to help Judah. He says, Judah, I'm going to show you. You might think that you're incapable. You might think that you're too small and you need somebody else, but I'm going to show you my power. I'm going to show you my strength. And instead, they thought that they needed help. Well, why would they do this? Why would they go contrary to God's word? Because they had a small view of who God was. They had a small view of what God could actually do. They put God in a box. They viewed God as a, a slightly stronger, better, more moral, moral version of themselves. And they put him as a small God. See, if we don't believe that God is sufficient or adequate to do what he says he's going to do, well, then that's communicating that our hearts have a very small view of who God is. And it's much smaller than he actually is in the pages of Scripture. See, when our God is small, when our God is not strong enough, when our God is not adequate enough, we might not even say those words, but those might be things that we believe in our heart. When our God is small, then we feel like he needs our help. He needs our strength. He needs our ability. He needs us to help accomplish the task. When we live with a small view of who God is, then ultimately the next generation suffers because they're seeing our view of God. They're seeing how we view the God of the Bible and what he says, and they're impacted by it. See, that next generation doesn't learn to trust in God. Rather, they learn to trust in themselves. That's the way mom and dad did it. They didn't pray. They didn't have dependency upon God. They just took matters into their own hands. They did it themselves. And what happens is we move from dependency upon God to doing what is right in our own eyes. You see, what we need to do is this, and this is our, our sub-point of that point there. We need to let the next generation see how big our God is. We need to live with a big view of who God is so that the next generation sees it and they develop that same big view of God. So in your sickness, in your troubles, in your financial woes, in your difficult days, in your good times, in your success and in your happy times, you should be portraying what it means to live with a big view of who God is. Not that I did these things but that God has been working miraculously through my life and I'm going to praise him evermore. Create discussions in your home with your children or your younger people about the greatness of who God is. What we know is that God is big and he's a sufficient God. We read that in the pages of scripture, but we also see that here in chapter 1, verse 1. We see that in the phrase, after the death of Joshua. The military hero, the, the spiritual hero, the national hero, Joshua, is dead. And God's kingdom doesn't stop. God's promises don't live and die with Joshua, just like they didn't live and die with Moses. They continue. Because the promise is rooted in who God is. 
and his, his big view, the big view of who he is. It's not rooted in, in a leader. The promise didn't live and die with these men. God is the one who's leading. See, our help is in the name of the Lord because he's the sufficient one. It's, the help is not in our favorite Christian hero or our favorite pastor or our favorite author. Our, 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 our faith and our trust is not in, in Pastor Todd. Your faith and your trust is, is hopefully not in me. Because what will happen is all of us, like the broken saviors and the broken judges, we will let you down, will fail you. Our help is in the name of the Lord because he is sufficient. Our hope is in the big God that he is, that he'll accomplish his perfect plans for Mill Creek Community Church and for Israel in the book of Judges. When, t- when hard times hit, we really see how big our God is. And not only do we see how big our God is, but our children and the next generation see how big our God is. So when those hard times hit, do we listen to God's word or do we supplement it with our own strength? God needs me to be more proactive. Oh, God, I, I just need to make a little bit more money. And if I do that, then, then it's okay. You, you, can, you can work through those circumstances. We fail when we have a small view of God. The second point is this. We fail when we don't fully believe the promises of God. Look at verse 19. Verse 19, talking about Judah and the the verses that follow in between here, I'd, I'd encourage you to read them, describes how Judah specifically took over the land. But verse 19 is an indictment on Judah. It says this, And the Lord was with Judah, and he took possessions of the hill country, but... He could not drive out the inhabitants of the plain because they had chariots of iron. Judah, in verse 2, had been given the promise of of God. I have given you the land. I'm the one who's doing the work. That promise of God was not empty, but under our first point, it was a big God who was promising that to them. So what does Judah do with that promise? Well, they don't fully take over the land. They don't fully believe it. And what do they do? It says that they could not. I don't think it's that they could not. I think it's that they would not. They did not do what God asked them to do. God promised to give them the land and they did not take it all. So one of two things happened. Either God failed or or the people failed. What we know about God is that he's powerful enough to bring the most unlikely of victories. If we read any stories that lead up to Judges, we read how God brought those unlikely victories. He had done it in their past at Jericho. He had done it in their past with Egypt. He had done it all throughout the past of Israel. He had brought unlikely victories to his people. At Jericho, God gave them a promise. He says, I've given you this land, the same promise that he gives them now, And then he gives them a decisive victory over a fortified city, and all they had were trumpets. Right? Imagine if that's all our military had. That would be scary, right? But God gives the victory. So the question is, could not God have given them the victory over chariots of iron? He gave them victory over a fortified city with trumpets. Chariots of iron? That's an afterthought. Judah didn't believe the promise was good enough to extend all the way to the chariots of iron that they saw, so they did not drive out the people of the land. They could have in God's power, but they did not. And what we see is that the sin of Judah was this. It was an act of unbelief on their part. But it wasn't just them. The whole nation did this. Look at verse 21. Benjamin did not drive out. Verse 27, these are the tribes of Israel. Verse 27, Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants. Verse 28, when all of Israel grew strong, that means they had military might, they did not drive out the inhabitants. So even when they had the military power to do it, they didn't do it. Unbelief. They didn't fully believe the promises of God. These are deliberate acts of unbelief. And God's promises. Verse 29, Ephraim did not drive out. Verse 30, Zebulun did not drive out. Verse 31, Asher did not drive out. 
Verse 33, Naphtali did not drive out. Verse 34, Dan was pressed back into the hill country. They couldn't even win. Throughout the whole entire nation, unbelief ruled the day. And they did not live according to the promises of God. The unbelief was permeating the nation and it impacted the next generation. You say, well, how, how do we know that it impacted the next generation? Look at Judges 2, verse 3. God speaking to his people says this, So now I say, I will not drive out them, the Canaanites, before you, but they shall become thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare to you. See, because they did not believe the promises of God fully, they allowed the sin of these nations to continue, and it impacted them. But it didn't just impact them. It's going to impact their generations and the next generations and the next generations. So, so our sub-point to this point is this. We need to let the next generation see our strong belief in the promises of God. That we believe that our God can act on the promises that he promises to us in Scripture. That he's going to do those things. That we're not just hoping that he'll do those things, but we are sure that he'll do those things. The next generation needs to see that we believe that God is as strong as he says he is. See, if the next generation sees our unbelief in God's promises, then we build a generation of unbelief. We need to live like the promises of God are real in your life. We need to pray. We need to worship. We need to disciple like the promises of God are real and active promises. And when we do, we build up a generation of strong faith, not a generation of unbelief. Our third point is this. We fail when we forget all that God has done. We fail when we forget all that God has done or God's works. Look at Judges 2 verse 1. Now the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bachim, and he said, I brought you up from Egypt, and I brought you into the land that I swore to give to your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you. God reminds them of the ways that he had provided for them and taken care of them. He reminds them in two ways. The first way is kind of a, an unlikely way. Maybe you wouldn't pick it up if you didn't study uh, on, a, on a very deep level, these towns that he talks about. But he says, the angel of the Lord came from where? Gilgal. Why was Gilgal important? Why, why is that an important area? Because it might not mean much to us that he came from that city up to Bachem, but Gilgal was where God made a covenant with the people of Israel to say, I'm giving you the promised land. In my power, in my strength, I'm promising, I'm making a covenant with you that this is your land. So if the promise fails, it's not up to you, it's up to me as the God of the nation. And immediately after, the people solidify that covenant with circumcision. And immediately after that, God defeats Jericho for them. So Gilgal, in the Israel mindset, that's where the angel of the Lord came from, would have represented God's amazing work in the life of Israel. They would have remembered what God did there at Gilgal. But then the second way God reminds them of what he's done for them is, he says, I brought you up out of Egypt. You remember that account? You remember what happened? Remember how that whole thing shook down? The world power of the day, Egypt, was eliminated by God. Right? He parts the Red Sea, they cross over, and as Egypt is crossing over, he closes the Red Sea upon them and wipes out a nation's military. One move, God did it. God says, you remember what I did. Do you remember the strength that I had? Do you remember the great works that I was doing? I did it in, a, in an unlikely way, and I did it without you. You didn't build a dam and stop the Red Sea. I parted it. And then I closed it. And you can't drive out these weak nations. I eliminated the world power of the day. And you can't drive out the parasites. Who even are these people? What we see is that Israel had forgotten what God had done. And in turn, they became dependent upon themselves to do the work. They were not dependent upon the testimony of God's work. They were dependent upon their own work. Let me just tell you, that's an awful place to be. 
See, their failure to remember God's mighty acts impacted them, but also impacted the next generation. So our sub-point here is this. We need to let the next generation hear the testimony of God's work. We need to let the generation that follows us hear the testimony of God's work in our lives. In our discipleship groups, we should be extolling how God has worked and the mighty works and acts that he's done in our lives and praising him for it. Because when we do that, we're extolling the mighty acts of God so that they see how big our God is. And they desire a God that that's, that's that big. And they start to see God in their lives and how he provides for them. So in our discipleship groups, we should be doing this. In our community groups, don't shy away from sharing the testimony of what God has done. In our meetings with the next generation, in our youth, in our children's services, we need to tell them of the greatness of who God is. And the easiest and most sure way to do that is through your testimony. Your testimony is one of the greatest ways that God has acted and, and, and worked in your life. And he continues to work. Share with them the good news of what he's accomplished in your family, in your health journey, in your professional life. God's working in all of those things. Let the next generation see your big God. See his amazing work and hear it in your testimony. And in doing so, we disciple the next generation. Our fourth and final point is this. <clears throat> we fail in our discipleship of the next generation when sin does not drive us to true repentance. We fail in our discipleship of the next generation when our sin does not drive us to true repentance. Let me read the last verses that DeWitt read for us. Verse 4 of chapter 2. As soon as the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the people of Israel, the people lifted up their voices and wept. And they called the name of that place Bachim. And they sacrificed there to the Lord. At first glance, we would say the response of the people is great. They weep. They cry. They're brokenhearted over the words of the Lord and how they failed. They're brokenhearted over their unbelief. They even offer a sacrifice. All great things. But if there's no heart behind the tears, if there's no heart behind the sacrifice, if they're just doing it to appease an angry God at their unbelief, then they're doing it for the wrong reasons. And the writer leaves us on a cliffhanger. What happened? What did all the tears bring? What did the sacrifice and the sadness produce? And the answer is nothing. It produced nothing. How do you know that, Pastor Brandon? Well, because I read my Bible, right? Look at verse 10. And all that generation... The generation who wept, the generation who was brokenhearted over their sin, all that generation were gathered to their fathers, and there arose another generation who wept after their sin. No. There arose the next generation after them who did not know who the Lord was or the work that he had done for Israel. There were tears, there were sadness, but they did not produce true heart change. What we believe about repentance is this, is that true repentance will change us. True repentance will change our hearts. See, the most that the word of the Lord did to Israel was to bring tears, and that's it. If we come here and we read God's word and we weep and we're sad and we leave here and we do nothing with it, we're no different than the nation of Israel. Dale Davis, a commentator, says it this way. Our response to Yahweh's accusing word should be more than just wet eyes. See, it was good to be moved to tears, but it's better to be brought to repentance. See, they were sad. They were extremely sad at their sin, but it did not drive them to take sin seriously, and they establish a cycle that will, ex it will establish them for 300 years where they rebel against God. They fall into idolatry. They cry out because they're oppressed. God judges them, and they bring a nation to oppress them. They cry out to God and say, God, why are we being oppressed? God raises up a judge and empowers them to deliver the people. They experience peace, and then in their comfort and their peace, they sin again 
again. And then they're oppressed. And then they cry out to God. And he raises up another judge. And then they have peace. And it happens for 300 years. It cycles like that. Why? Because their sin never broke their heart. What would happen if Israel truly repented and turned from their sin of unbelief? See, what we believe about true repentance is this, that it brings revival. It brings a desire to be different, a desire to change. And that revival is the Holy Spirit's conviction in our lives of sin. See, it's it's in God's power that we change our actions. It's in God's power that we change our desires. It's in God's power that Israel could have become what they, were, what they were destined to be, but they took matters into their own hands. They didn't believe in the power of God. They didn't repent and lament over their sin, and they shut out the Holy Spirit's work. See, if our sin breaks our heart but never changes our heart, then we'll be left with wet eyes and a lost generation. Our subpoint under this is this. We need to let the next generation experience revival out of our repentance. Oh, someone's alarm went off. That means it's 11 and I need to be done, right? I promise you. I'm wrapping it up. I, I, listen, I get passionate up here sometimes. I, I, I'm wrapping it up, I promise, right? We need to let the next generation experience revival out of repentance. So let me ask you this, what are the sins of our generation that we need to lament and repent over? What are those sins that are evident in your home and in your life that are impacting the next generation, that are not breaking your heart, that will not break their hearts? Is it nationalism? That's a sin. To, to so love what we have here that it, that it goes above and beyond who we are as Christians. Is it, is it idolatry, the idolatry of family or the idolatry of work or the idolatry of money and things? Is it sexual immorality? What is it? Unless we truly repent, then we'll never have revival in our hearts. And if there's not revival in our hearts, what's going to impact the next generation? You see, without revival in our hearts, what are we passing on? See, if we want the next generation to be different, if we want them to be brokenhearted over the sin, then the sin should be breaking our hearts. And we should, be, we should be personally running to the throne of God and confessing and repenting and lamenting. But I know this to be true. Even if we fail in our baton transfer, our God does not fail. His grace will be extended to the next generation. But let me tell you this. If God is convicting your heart now, don't just trust in his grace and say, well, he'll just take care of the next generation. Do something about it. Don't be King Hezekiah that we studied last week that was lured into comfort and complacency that says, I don't need to do anything. They'll fend for themselves. We need to be doing it to the next generation. We need to be ministering to the next generation. So the question is, how? How are you impacting the next generation? Are you encouraging a big view of God or a small view of God? Are you encouraging them to put their faith fully in the promises of God? Or are you encouraging them to do half-hearted belief and dependency upon God's promises? Are you declaring the testimony of God's work or are you silent? And is your repentance and your broken heart towards sin Encouraging revival in your heart and revival in the next generation. See, as we study this book of Judges, what we know is this, is we're going to see more failure. This is just the first of many failures for them. But I promise you that we'll see this. We'll see a fuller picture of God's grace, God's love, and God's mercy, and God's justice on full display. So I would encourage you, to make it a point to join us on this 16-week journey as we look at the cycle of the judges, as we look at what God is going to do through the book of Judges. And I pray that it would shape how you see God. I pray that it would shape how you lead your homes. It would shape how you disciple to the next generation. I'll have the praise team come. We'll close our time. God, we thank you so much. God, we thank you that there is a book called Judges that you've included in your word 
to guide us and to direct us and to expose where we are failing as well. God, let us not be lulled into an action by reading a book like this, but God, let it convict, let it indict our hearts today. That God, we would not just sit here and say, it's good for me, but who cares about the next generation? God, let us be burdened. Let us be living differently because of the great big God that you are. Let us be living fully in light of your promises, fully in light of who you are. God, break our heart for our sin. God, I pray that prayer for myself as I was studying that this week, that God, you would break my heart and help me repent over my sin. And God, you showed it to me this week. God, I pray that you'd bring revival in my heart. You'd bring revival in the hearts of these people. That God, that the next generation would be impacted for your glory, for your purposes. And God, we love you. As we sing now this final song, God, I pray that we would be able to worship with hearts fully singing the truth of this song is that you are a great God. We have a big view of you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. We'll ask you to just be seated for a second here. We have some people uh, that are going to be joining our church here today, and we want to recognize them. So if you are joining, uh, I think we have Florence and Mary. You can come on down to the front here. Um, and as they do, let me just remind you, church membership is a vital thing in this day and age. Membership is how we are accountable to one another. It's a, being a part of this family here, and we truly believe that we are a family here at MCC. So uh, Florence and Mary, thank you for coming down. Um, just to give you a little bit of window into what they're getting here, um, we, we mention this every single time, they get a Bible. A Bible is not for them. That Bible is to pass on to somebody else because that is part of reaching the next generation is equipping them with God's word. The other book that they get is a Nine Marks book on church membership, just extolling what it means to be a church member. These people have been through the, 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 um, the church membership class. Um, and again, this is the last week. If you want to sign up for that next, this next class that's coming up, if not, we're going to be running those all throughout the year. We're excited about those different things. So definitely take advantage of that. We'd love to have you just be aware of more of what the church does, how we operate on um, the business side of church, but then also the spiritual side of what it means to be a church member. The two members that we have down here today are, are people that we're going to be adding to our church. Uh, the first one is Mary Rupeshevsky. Did I say that right? Rupeshevsky. You set me up for failure. It's okay. <laughs> Listen, I, I mentioned all those really crazy names in the Bible, and I failed on your name. That's sorry. All right? Mary, we're so glad that you're here. Mary serves. She's, she's been serving in our children's ministry. She serves as a greeter. You probably see her back there. Um, we are just very excited about her joining the church, I'm excited about what that means for us as the family of MCC grows. And then our second member here is Florence Schallenberger. Florence, uh, I think she's here at the church almost as much as I am, to be honest. Um, if you look in the, the seat back pockets in front of you, every week if you're like, how do all of those papers and pens get in there? Because I know my kids steal them, right? <laughs> how do they get back in there? Well, the answer is Florence. She comes every single week faithfully, and she's got a little cart. She scoots up and down these aisles, and she stuffs all of those chairs. So, so if you see Florence, thank her for that, because that is a huge ministry. Because that's not just a, a small ministry of our church, that's a huge ministry. Because what we know about this is it's a hospital for sinners. And, and, and we know that if the hospital is not cleaned, guess what? People will still die even if you have the best doctors in the world. And what we know is that every job is important from the greeting ministry to stuffing cards to everything that we do here, it's important. And we're excited about that. So if you are just as excited about me that Mary and Florence are joining our church, can we just give them an Amen. Here's what we'll do. We're going to ask them to stay up here. And here, here's what I want. This is, this is an awesome thing that I, I love doing here at this church. Just swing by the front and welcome them to the family here at MCC. Come by, shake their hand, say, we're so glad that you're joining. Uh, and we'll be excited that, that as you take that next step and you join, we can welcome you as well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we thank you so much that as we just sang, God, we can sing hallelujah, the highest praise to our great God. Thank you that you are great, that you are mighty to save, 
to deliver and to empower us for every single day. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Just a reminder, we are a sent people. Go and make disciples.